Uh, and finally, we'll hear from Heather Sherrard, Vice President, Clinical Services at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Heather's case study deals with a telehome care program. Heather. Uh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here and share with you some of the findings that we uh, had as part of this program. I can talk without my slides if I have to. Um, so a little bit of context. I'd be the first one to tell you that if you're going to um, uh, put in a technology such as we're doing is never buy your technology and then look for a patient to use it on. That is the biggest learning and, and it is interesting that people can't seem to get past that. So a bit of context. We're the only tertiary cardiac center for our region. We serve about 1.5 million people, um, and 50% of our patients are outside of the Ottawa region. So we have a very high distribution uh, in terms of our urban-rural uh, split. The other interesting factor for us is that when you get into those rural communities, the prevalence of disease is dramatically higher for cardiac disease. So uh, not only are many of the patients away, the very sickest patients also live uh, farther from us. So I want to talk for two seconds about a telehealth framework. It's not as simple as, to, in our view, as just going out and buying a piece of technology. You have to think about how you want to use this technology, and you have to integrate a series of technologies so that you bridge the patient and the patient experience among them. So we use these strategies on five main principles. It has to enhance the care to patients, and if we aren't doing better for patients, we don't consider the technology. It has to improve access, and not just to uh, procedures, but to actual, can I get a hold of someone who can actually help me? Uh, it has to assist patients to stay in their communities, uh, and our role is to keep patients uh, closer to home for as long as we can. Uh, we always look at patient satisfaction, and we actually improve the satisfaction, and then we finally look at the efficient use of resources. So very briefly, this is our telehealth strategy, um, and you'll see that there's three layers. I'm going to be talking about the middle one, which is telehome, but it's important that you understand these are integrated strategies, and the patients roll through these strategies depending on what they need. So the first one is telemedicine. Many of you will know this. That's high bandwidth to be able to do consultations and uh, real-time uh, uh, work. Telehome care is where we put monitors into the homes of patients. They plug it into their phone lines or use a modem to go over the cell towers, uh, and we can actually monitor them from home real time. And the third strategy that we use is automated calling. We have a number of automated calling programs that we graduate you onto once you've been for, through those more acute ones. So it's a very important strategy, and we use all three of those in a variety of different conditions that we have. So why home monitoring and why is it important to patients? Well, first of all, the majority of our patients actually live outside the Ottawa area, and we have a preponderance of elderly and frail elderly in the population that we serve. Uh, heart failure is a very common disease, and most of heart failure patients are not treated by specialists. They're actually cared for by primary care physicians. It's a very chronic condition, as many of you know, but it has very uh, episodic points in its trajectory where you absolutely have to be in an acute care facility to get uh, retitrated and then you can go back to the community. So you still need that linkage between primary and secondary care. It is one of the most common diagnoses in terms of why people come to hospital. It has a staggering readmission rate, 25% at a month uh, and upwards of 50% within a year. Congestion, which is fluid buildup which is relatively simple to treat, is the primary reason for readmission. Um, and we know in evidence that self-care or patients who understand their condition and can manage their condition do much better, uh, as does uh, an environment where you use a multidisciplinary team, and we've sort of talked about that. For those of you who may not have seen it, this is just a snapshot. This is what we send home to patients. That little um, uh, monitor in the right-hand corner is about uh, the pound, weighs about two pounds of butter, sort of equivalent, speaks eight languages, talks to the patient, walks them through what they have to do. They have attachments that come, which is a weigh scale, a blood pressure pulse, and the little button thing at the bottom is an ECG. So those are very important tools for the kinds of patients that we see. That information drops uh, down through their phone line or a modem through the cell towers um, into a a system where we have a nurse, these are all advanced practice nurses, and they actually have parameters for each of the patients that have been established with the patients before they're discharged, um, and then we monitor them. And if there's problems, if they're doing good, great. If there's problems, we call them and actually intervene. So we want to talk a little bit about evidence. Uh, as you can see, these were sort of the four major uh, original studies that started looking at home monitoring. Um, and just for disclosure, I'm actually um, an author on the Wooden study in 2008. What you can see from this is everybody was dabbling in telehome care in around the early 2000s, and we were all dabbling at the same time. So when you try to compare 
studies, there's almost no hope. Um, some are large, some are small, uh, some uh, looked at readmission, some looked at uh, quality of life. And so in those early days when you're trying to innovate, not having a good solid base of evidence that was common that you could make huge generalizations off of was a challenge. And so that's one of my messages around the whole innovation piece. We were very fortunate in the early days to be supported by the Change Foundation and the Abbey Foundation who actually funded a lot of what our early work does. So all that to say the first few years were traumatic at best. It was a hard time to get a grant because there was no evidence. Um, and you, you just have to keep plodding on and moving forward. Then around 2010, Co the Cochrane came out with a review which was substantially more helpful, although it reviewed two different kinds of strategies, which you know when you do meta-analysis is problematic. It looked at telephone structured work as well as home monitoring. And those are not the same, but they were clumped together for the purposes of this was good because there were 25 RCTs. Uh, you can see the split out on there, but what we started to see was some convergence around, yes, this is actually good. Uh, you get uh, improvements in all-cause mortality, uh, and you get some uh, benefits around readmission. And those are the things when we talk, a lot of us talk about efficiency, that's what we're looking at. So in that kind of an environment, you still have to be committed, I think, to, to creating evidence yourself. You have, uh, we have large pools of patients that are in here, and so we actually undertook ongoing studies, uh, research studies, to make sure that what we were doing was right in the face of some of the changes. So the first study was done in 2008. It was a cohort of 121 patients, um, and I'll summarize it by saying there was a five-fold decrease between before and after home monitoring in the same patients. So that's huge. That's all comers, but it's five-fold. And we would be about $1,000 a day all in at our, at our facility for cost, and the average length of stay is seven, 000, uh, is seven days. So that's a 7,000 case difference on a five-fold reduction. So quite a huge piece, and it you know, prompted us to say this is probably something we should keep doing. We then did a, a bit more of a rigorous study. We did a case match cohort. So if you know heart failure, there's four classes. Uh, one is good, four is bad. And you should really compare bad hearts against bad hearts because you will readmit more as you're in that last stage of life and, and maybe dying. So we did look at a matched case cohort. We took a, a 21 of our home monitoring patients uh, with an average age of 70 and matched them against patients who weren't getting home monitoring. And again, we saw a statistical difference in matched patients at uh, six month readmission. And six months is a good time point for heart failure. So again, we added to the evidence that said, no, this isn't just a pre and post. When you match them, there's difference. The third study we did, and this was in response to people who think that the elderly can't use technology and are not interested in it. People would say, oh, you know, the elderly, they, don't, they won't use it, they can't use it. They use it, they love it, and there is no difference. So it doesn't matter if you're less than 75 or over 75, you are not more resource intensive when we put you onto home monitoring, and you are equally as capable of using the system and gaining from it. So again, um, sort of more evidence that, that supported our, our move. A Little bit about innovation diffusion. So as I mentioned, we were funded initially um, as a research in initiative from two foundations who uh, actually really took quite a leap in, uh, in supporting us. It is a nurse-managed system with a medical lead, and that's the person we go to for uh, questions. When we started, we had one advanced practice nurse, and she did 20 monitors. So that was the initial study, and it only came for our institute. So you had to land in the Heart Institute to be able to get on this system. It is and remains a five-day operation, eight to four, uh, but we do have 24-7 coverage for questions, which is something we've always had at the Institute. There is no home visits. visits. If you go to the US, that they think this is just incredibly um, unusual that you don't actually go to the home and install the equipment. You know, these are people that have never been to Northern Ontario and don't understand what that would mean. Um, and we use Greyhound Bus. This is not an advertisement. They're wonderful. We send our stuff out with patients and give them a way bill and they send it back to us and Greyhound keeps an eye out on these little gray cases for us. We accept non-physician referrals and always had. There is always an intake letter and um, uh, communication with the family uh, physicians of these patients. And they, in the early days, we monitored them for about three or four months, which is a, about the optimal time. So for the person who talked about pilot projects, I'm a firm believer it's a death in pilot projects. If you set it out as a pilot project, that's all you'll ever get from it. So we actually set this in motion with that when we have the evidence to say we will make this a program. So now we've followed about 1,500 patients. We have one RN now who sees about 100 patients. That's the, that's the most they can manage in a day. 
that's a combination of about 40 monitors and, about, and the remainder of those 60 patients are people that come in on our automated calling systems. They're still monitored for about three to four months, but we now actively transition them to a calling system, uh, which just calls them to check on them. They don't actually download vital signs. But we've found that they still need that transition. That's what they told us when we did the evaluation. We have a hub and spoke model now for the region. So where you used to have to come to the Heart Institute, now we have put monitors in all of our 14 hospitals based on the size of their hospital. And physicians with criterion can put patients on in their own hospitals. We still centrally monitor them because there's a critical mass around the knowledge base you need for these patients. But every hospital has its own monitors and can, can send their own patients. So they don't have to come to Ottawa anymore. Uh, we have 158 monitors and scales and modems and things that we use, but we've also added um, other tools because these people usually have three or four chronic diseases, so we also have glucose cables, we have INR cables, which are for people who, uh, who need anticoagulants, et cetera. So very um, slow growth, but now it, it's got full penetration within the uh, region. And we now have a transitional care framework where all these patients are now called at two days. So this just gives you an idea of what the um, expansion has been over the last three or four years. Each one of those little blue H's is a hospital, and each one of them now has the ability to put their own patients on, keep the patients closer to home, and still be able to manage them in a way that's helpful. In addition to that, we also have uh, one-of-a-kind programs that uh, we provide for people across the country, and so some of you may not be aware, but we've had telehome monitoring now in every province. We simply send the monitors home, uh, tell the people to plug it into their phone lines, uh, and then from across the country they will actually um, uh, return the monitors again by, by Greyhound bus or some other version of Greyhound bus. Funding, 75% of the initial equipment was funded through grants and research. Our original work was done with Nortel where they built us uh, equipment because it didn't exist. We now buy it off the shelf. Uh, our permanent staff is now funded through our LIN because of the changes that we've seen and the benefits that we've seen. Uh, we leverage, we don't talk about cost savings, we, we talk about capacity building because we actually are keeping patients out of the hospital and that is freeing up new, new beds and capacity for us to um, bring in what is sort of a tsunami of patients coming uh, with chronic disease. And so we use a cost avoidance model. If you were to ask me our lessons learned, using regular phone lines is not very sexy, but you know what, it works and it's very cost effective. Uh, patients are successful at connecting equipment in their homes. The people in the U.S. told us they will never figure it out. And we had a uh, very elderly gentleman who said one time, and he put it so perfectly, he said, you know, I can turn my lamp on, I can connect this thing, and they just plug it into the phone line. So, you know, and he was, I think, 92. So it's good for everyone. So the technology is reliable, and it produces valid data. So you are downloading people's vital signs and changing their drugs based on the download. So we have tested it. It's accurate, um, and, and people don't have to worry about the technology. Um, it can be adapted to meet individual patient needs. So this particular one, we change the volume. There's nine languages. Uh, you can change the frequency of transmissions. We say transmit in the morning. Some patients just aren't morning people, so they transmit at a different time. Uh, and it asks clinical questions. So we can put a clinical screen in there asking patients questions. And they are connected to us at any time if, if they're not comfortable, they can actually call in. The infrastructure makes a collaborative care model. It's very interesting when I put no billing issues. This is a non-physician system. Uh, so there's no billing issues. People said, oh, the family docs are not going to like this, but it doesn't interfere with their billing. They see their patients whenever they want. Uh, and we have never had any family physician uh, get back to us with any concerns. They're always part of the care team. Uh, and in fact, they love it because they let us know when their next visit is and we download by fax all of the vital signs for that patient that have come in in the monitoring system since they've been uh, seen. So it's been a very successful um, program for us. We're very happy to share. We do a lot of presentations. We have a lot of people do uh, come in and see us. And this is sort of our motto. You have to do the right thing at the right time and in the right place. And that uh, email is my APN, and if anybody's interested, she knows way more about it than I do. Thank you.